right to work checks. If Brexit is going to mean anything, then the government has to be seen at least to be taking back control of our borders. And one of the tools in its armory is making sure that employers do not employ illegal workers. So on December the 17th, they slipped through some fresh guidance without much publicity or fanfare on how to carry out right to work checks, including some important new provisions for online checks. This is really essential for employers to get a handle on. And during this webinar, we're going to cover who right to work checks apply to, which employers need to carry them out, which workers you need to carry them out on, how you carry them out, and how you record them. It is all about creating an audit trail to show that you have done your job so that if subsequently you were found to be employing an illegal worker, it would have been impossible for anybody acting reasonably to have found that out. Our webinar is going to last about 40 minutes and we'll cover all of these aspects. So without further ado, let me move to just what we're going to be covering today. We're going to talk briefly about the new immigration system. We're going to talk about the rules as they apply to the EEA nationals, as it says uh, in the guide, um, rather than EU nationals. That's a slightly enlarged area. Norway, Iceland and Liechtenstein, I think, are included in the European economic area. And it also applies to Swiss nationals as well. We're going to talk very specifically about how you should do a check because there's some very important wording you need to be putting on your documents and how you need to keep those documents. And finally, and some of these were, were things that I don't say surprised us, but might surprise you, were some of the legal pitfalls when you're doing your right to work checks. So this is what's brought it about. Um, We've been used to using European maps to look for things like how coronavirus is going. This has been taken from there. The, e, the EU no longer cont contains the UK, and it's very graphic in this map. It is also very graphic in terms of the government's own words, um, which you can read for yourself here. But the new system will treat EU and non-EU citizens equally so that from the start of this year, EU and non-EU citizens will be treated equally if they want to come to the UK for work. Uh, we'll talk about what happens to those who are already here in a bit. And the system's designed to make it easier for skilled workers from around the world to come to the UK through an employer-led system. So that is the background. This is also the background as well. This was the Financial Times headline on Tuesday, I think. And in case you can't read the detail there, an estimated 1.3 million foreign workers have gone home, um, specifically in the hospitality and retail sectors being the most heavily affected. So workers are fleeing the UK at the moment. And they've already highlighted that thousands of EU care workers in the UK still haven't registered for pre-settled status, even though they may well have been living here for some time. Um, they, they estimate about 20, 25 percent haven't registered for pre-settled status, but they do have until the end of June to do so. Um, Bear in mind that about 20% of people still haven't submitted their tax return either, and they've got a deadline of Sunday to do that, although I gather it's been slightly extended. So um, the new immigration system. We've issued a number of articles about this and covered it in our webinars, but there is a new immigration system coming in. It's points based. Anybody who's arriving in the UK from the start of this year, all non-UK nationals will be treated the same. 
And broadly speaking, and there are some exceptions and there are some routes into the country through entrepreneur schemes and graduate schemes and so on and so forth. But if you want to recruit a foreign worker, broadly speaking, they'll have to fall into one of two categories, a skilled or a highly skilled worker, which is, again, broadly speaking, A-level and degree level workers, and employers will have to sponsor them. The one exception is those from the EEA who had settled here before the end of last year will have a right under the um, the treaty or exit from, from the EU to settled or pre-settled status so long as they register for that before the end of June this year. Cathy, perhaps you'd like to um, talk through the sort of actions that people should be carrying out now. So in um, February of 2008, uh, the government introduced a requirement on employers to undertake right to work checks. Now, the good news is that if you have been doing these checks, then the system as of now, the principles are roughly the same. The important thing to bear in mind is that the government already expects that you have been doing these checks. So when we talk later on about lists A and B, you should be familiar with them if you've been doing the checks. However, ask yourself the question, how thorough have we been in following up list B workers who are the time limited permission to work? And in terms of new recruits, if you already employ EU workers, nothing changes until the end of June 21. Hopefully, they'll have already made their settlement status. But as Guy has said, they're conscious that there's a lot of people who haven't yet done it. If, however, they are new recruits and they're new to you this year, but have resided in the UK before the 31st of December, then they will be able to go through the right to work checks um, as before. So in many ways, if you're familiar with the system, not a lot has changed. OK, thank you. So this is a very helpful chart if you like flow charts. And we're going to send you a copy of this. This is that CIT, CIPD produced this. Um, and the really important thing, if you can read it, is the first box where it says begin is the candidate a UK or Irish national or the holder of an indefinite leave to remain or the holder of another permission granting the right to work, including EU settled status? You go straight to the candidate should have the right to work. Anything else, and it gets a bit more complicated and probably outside of um, outside of the 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 limits of this particular webinar, but it is worth looking at that in case you're wanting to see whether you need to become a sponsor to employ people from outside of uh, the UK. The new immigration system, I think, you know, we've, we've talked about it. We've talked about people um, under the EU settlement scheme. They have until June to do it. Importantly, up until the end of June was what's called the transitionary phase, um, and EU citizens, according to the guidance, only have to provide you with a copy of their passport or the national identity card to, as evidence of their right to work, and you can't check, you're not allowed to check whether they've applied for pre-settled status or not. We do suggest that you do ask them for evidence that they had settled in the UK before the end of last year, um, and they may have a council tax bill or bank account or something like that, that will be evidence that they've actually been over here before. And there's another important thing to say that the common travel area still exists. This is an area that was formed pre-EU membership. And that's between the UK, the Channel Islands, the Isle of Man and the Republic of Ireland. If somebody comes from a southern island, then they do have the right to work in the UK and we do have free movement of labour between those areas. So whatever happens with the EU, they have the right to work. OK, Peter, why are we trying to prevent illegal working? Because illegal working encourages illegal immigration 
and it's also associated with a number of bad things. Uh, employers of illegal migrants are probably gaining an unfair competitive advantage because they're undercutting on wages or, or indeed not paying market rates so that they get away with paying less or they don't pay tax all sorts of dodgy things going on there um, and that generally comes under the heading of market abuse uh, it's heavily linked to organized crime and it's heavily linked to modern slavery so it's not it's not the government being nasty to immigrants it's that it's the government trying to take care of people so that they're not exploited okay um, and who's who's liable? So who does the who does the Home Office or whoever the governing authority is hold hold liable for this happening? Yeah, both parties, primarily employers, but I think it's 2016 that the government said no. You know, the people themselves should be liable, so that they are also guilty of uh, criminal offences. So everyone involved uh, in simple terms and, and and you can't delegate that you can't blame it on hr you've got to somehow check that you've got competent hr people who, who are doing it or wages people or whoever's recruiting yeah the site manager needs to know what they're doing because if they don't it's your fault yeah okay okay kathy the new guidance talks about breaches and breaches are what lead to penalties. So can you just explain specifically what constitutes a breach? Well, a breach is if you have been employing someone who hasn't got the legal right to work in the UK. Um, and the slide shows all of the examples um, that that might end up being important things to note is aged over 16 um, and it might be that somebody came in for instance on holiday um, and they had the legal right to enter the country uh, because they were coming on holiday but then they stayed um, and um, actually they didn't have the permission to stay so there are all sorts of restrictions that are around that an employer can get uh, caught up in. Important things to remember, for instance, we were talking earlier, uh, seasonal agricultural workers um, that are permitted to come into the country to, for instance, pick daffodils. Um, that's all they can do, pick daffodils. Um, their permission to work will not extend to, for instance, helping out in the local pub uh, behind the bar. So there are all sorts of nuances that if an employer is not on top of it they could get themselves into trouble by inadvertently employing uh, people that don't have the right to work yeah okay so the message is that you don't just have to check that people have got the right to work but they've got the right to work to do that type of work as well on occasion yes yeah okay um okay so look the reasons that employers need to take really good notice of this is this could be quite expensive. Um, with a civil penalty of £20,000 per illegal worker, that could get quite expensive if you suddenly discover you've got uh, 23 daffodil pickers who are all illegal. Um, you could also, as an employer, get a criminal conviction up to five years in prison, uh, be disqualified as a director and the organisation, whatever it is, could suffer pretty badly as well. The courts can impose unlimited fines. They can close businesses, seize earnings, stop you from sponsoring migrants in the future. And if you're licensed for alcohol or taxi private hire, then you can lose your licence as well. So the very, very foundation of your business can be affected if you ignore this and you get caught out by immigration. And likewise, the penalties for workers are a little bit, seem a little bit less harsh, but uh, if you're not earning very much and all your wages are seized, that can be pretty tough, um, as well as six months in prison, deportation, and also it would be a significant black mark against your name if you ever tried to get into the country again. 
So, um, Kathy, uh, we know right to work checks are important. Can you explain what a statutory excuse means? Well, basically, if you um, if you are found to ha to have an illegal worker, but you had done genuine right to work checks then ostensibly you have a statutory excuse. excuse. Um, and that will avoid you from having to pay a civil penalty. So right to work checks are all about making sure you have that statutory excuse. Now, the really, really important part of this slide is the word worker. So you have to do right to work checks on people that you've issued a contract of employment to, um, even if they're, for instance, a casual worker that you're only planning to use on and off for a little while, they are a worker. Interestingly, contract for service. So for instance, you hire um, a consultant or maybe even a tradesperson to, to do a piece of work for you and they're a sole trader or perhaps they have a personal services company they still fall under the category of worker and therefore you must do a right to work check on them. And this is regardless of whether you ever got round to putting the arrangement in writing or not. Chances are you spoke orally, so some form of contract um, was formed and therefore the right to work checks apply. Now you can, in certain circumstances, delegate the checks to others. So, for instance, if you use um, a couple of agency companies for agency staff, then you must make sure um, that the, the agency companies uh, understand that it's their responsibility to do the right to work checks. Um, I would actually often suggest that you make sure it's even in your commercial contract wording um, that the obligation is on them to do those checks. So in essence, if for instance, you are aware that there are quite a lot of people that are workers, but they're not actually on your payroll, um, then it's a really, really good idea to make sure you use just reputable suppliers who are going to do those checks. Um, and if you're uncertain, make sure that you you audit these people because ultimately it, it might come back to you. We're not quite sure how. The government's been a bit vague on their wording on that, but it could do. Yeah, OK. And I think we we used the example when we were talking earlier of, of perhaps you have a lot of, you know, seasonal workers or something that are actually employed, brought to you by another agency. But, you know, you still need to be making sure somebody is checking them. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you're not certain, go and do an audit yourself just to give yourself peace of mind. Yeah. Yeah. OK. So, look, right to work checks. There are two types. They're broadly speaking only used to be one, which was the traditional manual check. But now the, the government has um, allowed an online check, which I'll talk about in a little while. Uh, and, and there is also some temporary provisions for remote manual checks done by a video call, which again we'll talk about later, um, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. The important thing to do, and I think a lot of people think, OK, it's OK if we do this in the first month. The government has made it very clear that whatever, whatever check you do, you must do it before an employee starts work. Now, I suspect you could do it at 9 a.m. on the day they start work and you'd probably be fine, but you should be doing it. You should be doing it before an employee starts work. And the manual right to work check, I think nearly everybody who's listening here will be familiar with this. Um, and this procedure really hasn't changed. You decide, and we're going to talk about list A and list B later on, uh, but list A is primarily for those who have a permanent right to stay in the UK and list B is for those who have a time limited or temporary right. You get whatever document is required, you inspect it 
with the document holder present. Um, and then you make a very specific um, certification on that document and retain a clear copy that can't be changed. So it's either in PDF format, preferably encrypted PDF format, or it is in um, a photocopy kept in a file and you keep those records. And the important thing to know is that those records, all the documentation you keep for the length of the employment plus two years. And that applies to everybody. So if they work for you for a day, you keep it for a, uh, two years of a day. If they work for you for 30 years, then you keep it for 32 years. So that's the manual right to work check. And there are some um, details about that that I'll ask Peter um, to go through because this is how you take a certified copy because you have to be very, very specific. Uh, you've got to use the, the right words. So you, you write down, <coughs> excuse me, this is a true reflection of the original documents. Then you'll put your name, your job title and sign it. And then rather than just date it, which is probably what I used to do in many years ago, you write down the date on which this right to work check was made on 28th of January 2021. Um, so it's it's that precise wording. And if you haven't got that wording for your current workforce, you probably ought to be redoing them. OK. OK. Yeah. And, and the important thing to say is you don't just get the document, but you actually need to check that the details on it are correct, like names, addresses, the photos match, the actual person you've got there and the right to work are correct and cover the type of work you want them to do. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is the difficult area. It's not an obvious forgery. And most of us aren't expert at spotting forgeries, but it doesn't look like it's just been knocked up on someone's jumble printing kit. Yes. Yes, exactly. So, Cathy, because you, you pointed out all of the wording that needed here. So, so the temporary remote checks, because we've had these temporary checks in place since the end of March last year because of COVID? Yes, so basically on the 30th of March 2020, the government published guidance called Coronavirus Right to Work Checks. And I think it's probably their only guidance that hasn't changed since the 30th of March. Yeah. Um, so it stayed all the way. So the temporary arrangements are, there is a recognition um, that you can't be potentially sitting in the same room looking at the original documents with the individual because lots of people are working from home. So now what they're saying is that the employee can scan, email or take a photograph and send to you the documents. You then have to arrange a video call whereby the purpose of the video call is so that you can actually check that the, the photograph is the same as the person that's on the video call with you. Uh, they are supposed to actually show you on the video call, hand up the original documents, which you then have a quick comparison with. Yes, this looks what I've been sent. And then you need to write down the wording that we've put in there for you. Um, now, the other thing that's important to remember is that you then later on have to do a retrospective check. Now, the government has said that will be eight weeks after returning to normal. Now, they have said that they will tell us when we're going to be returning to normal. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to that day. Um, however, when normal arrives, you must then do the check again and you must put in this wording. And the second date, if you're wondering, the prescribed right to work check was undertaken on. It's now the date that you're doing the retrospective check. So in essence, you're going to be having two dates, the one when they first started and then the one eight weeks after we get back to normal. And just to, just to say that that retrospective check is done like a manual check that you would normally do. So that's in person with the person you inspect their documents and make sure that they're correct. Yes, that's absolutely correct. Yeah. OK. And and what and then 
of the, the government instructs you that, that if you, when you do that and the retrospect check is failed, and it's difficult to see how it could be unless it was a forgery, then the employment um, has to cease. Correct. Yeah. No. Okay. Now, um, there's a new online right, right to work check. And if anybody's used to doing DVLA license checks, then it works exactly the same way. And this is specifically primarily aimed at EU citizens, in fact, um, and settled status. Uh, but it, we suspect it'll probably be extended to lots of others in time. What happens is that you ask the individual to um, log on to their own record and they provide you with a share code and that gives you access to it uh, for 30 days. And then you download um, in PDF form, you download a copy of that that right to work check. So you, you can see on the left hand side, there's an email giving you the shared code. Hopefully you could see that. And then on the right hand side, that's what you see on the screen. And there is a link there just above the green button that says download as a PDF. So you download that as a PDF and you keep that on file. And then finally, Finally, if all else fails, and um, I believe a number of our clients actually do use this service, there is a home office employer checking service, and you can do this for job applicants who are applying to you from abroad as well. If people can't show you documents because of the, their documents may be out there because they've got an appeal or there's an application with the home office, um, then you can use the home office um, employer checking service, and it's a um, I understand it's a sort of combination of online and phone in service. Um, and they will confirm if that person is on their list of people who is actually able to work either temporarily or time limited in the UK or even permanently. And importantly, if they're a Commonwealth citizen who started living in the UK before 1988, like going back a long way, then they should be on this list as well. There are two. There are, these are the sorts of checks that you have to have to make so that there is list A, and I'm sorry, that A should actually say B. So I'm not entirely certain why that's changed. But but um, so there are list A checks, list A checks um, relate to people with a permanent right to remain in the UK. And we're sending out the government guidance to you with the questions and answers at the end today. And that will have a full list of list A and a full list of list B documents, um, including group one documents, which are time limited, but generally for more than six months. And group B checks, which are people who have six months and they need to be rechecked after six months right to remain in the UK. And they they're very generally are people who are going through a process at the moment and you need to keep on checking every six months to check where they are in that process and whether they've moved up the list. And as I think Jackie asked us earlier on today, it's quite possible to move from group B to group A um, because you've, you've been in the UK for a sufficient length of time to get settled status and you've now got indefinite leave to remain. Um, so, um, Peter, list A yeah. checks. There's some important things here that need highlighting, I think. Yeah, yeah. it only it has, has to be done, done once. It's not something that you've got to do every year or every five years. And basically, you're looking at, generally speaking, passports, identity cards, registration tickets, or biometric immigration documents. The list is slightly longer, it's not an exhaustive list and that they effectively show um, the right to remain and work in the UK. So, so far, so good. Um, yeah, most people in this country will fit, uh, will pass the list a check. Yes, indeed. And once you've done that, the important thing to remember is you do it once, you get the right wording on your documentation, the certified copy, you put it in the file, mm. and that's it. As long as they remain working for you, you do not have to do that one again. That's correct. Yeah. List B is the more interesting lot. List B is much more interesting. So just 
briefly talk us through the group ones and group twos? Again, not exhausted lists, but basically that, that generally apply to people with, with a limit, a time limit and an expiration date. And that's where some of our clients have gone wrong. They've done all the checks when they started, but they didn't put something in the diary saying check in you know, January 2021 or whenever it might be that, um, that they are still OK. Um, because you know, they're no longer a student or, or whatever it might be. Okay, um, and we covered the need to reach out yeah. later. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and group two are those those people with six months. Yeah. Um, and you just got to monitor them probably even more closely and just make sure your diary system works. Just sort of making a note of, I'll look at it in a few months' time is probably not going to work unless you've got a phenomenal memory. Yeah, indeed. And Cathy, I think we talked about earlier, didn't we, the, the need to recheck. Yeah. So in essence, if you are employing people on list B, um, and we certainly know that some of our clients that when last year we were starting to talk to them about have you done right to work checks and have you started uh, establishing who's uh, EU? Um, a lot so a lot of them realised that they'd unintentionally um, let people as visas expired. Oh, all sorts of things have come to light. And it's not because people intentionally uh, meant for this to happen. Um, sometimes the employers have actually said, your visa's expired. What are you doing <laughs> about it? And, and some of them have rather quickly exited the country. Um, and others have said, oh, it's because I'm doing something different. Well, show us the documentation. So the important thing is to recheck. You've got to have some kind of robust system in place to make sure you're doing all of the regular auditing for anyone that turns up on your list B. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Indeed. Make sure you have a robust way of checking it. Yeah. And as you said earlier, um, you need to keep all the documentation in terms of the right to work checks that you've done uh, for the whole of their employment plus two years. OK, we're getting a whole load of questions in on the right hand side and some of them may well be covered, I think, in the next in the next section, which is legal pitfalls. Um, and this is the um, some of these have um, I think the discrimination point has been incredibly underlined, I suppose, in the government guidance about discrimination. You cannot discriminate. And um, Peter, um, I mean, that what that means in, in reality is that if you only bother to check the people who look a little bit different or sound a bit different, or the names are a bit different, you are in probably serious trouble. Um, you need to check everybody so that you, you yeah, because A, it will look wrong if people say, well, how come you're checking me, but not my mate that you took on last week? Um, it'll look like discrimination. And B, you will make mistakes. You know, people that you think are okay, might not have that automatic right. So you just need to check everybody. Um, it's just got to be done. I know there's a question from someone saying, oh, I've known this young man since he was born. I went to school with his parents. Yeah. Why do I need to check him? And, and the answer is, well, because you've got to, because otherwise you've just got a gap in your records and you might not be there forever uh, and it'll just look like a an uncomfortable gap. I think you need to be careful. Uh, yeah. You are doing things properly uh, because, you know, it is all about nationality, race. You know, it's sensitive and people will get very sensitive if they think that you are applying it in a, a manner that they're not, that you're not applying it to other people. Okay, I think there were a couple of other things, in fact. Just because somebody turns around and says, no, I'm not going to let you use the online checking service, you have to do a manual check, 
you can't yeah. discriminate against them. In other words, it's yeah. their right to say you could you just yeah. maybe to check my my records. Also, and this I think sort of it's semi intuitive, isn't it, Guy? Yes. It, it basically says if you were trying to recruit someone for a permanent post and they've only got temporary right to work, you can't say, oh, we're not going to consider you because you've only got temporary right to work or you're saying you've only got temporary right to work. And uh, yeah. you have to treat them the same. You have to treat them the same. Mm -hmm. And if you are going to draw a distinction between them, it has to be another distinction and not just because of their temporary or permanent rights to work. Yeah, and um, you can't pick on people and say, oh, you may be an EA national, but, you know, You've told me you're not bothered, you haven't bothered to apply, so we're not going to take you on. No, um, okay. We're in that transitionary period. So I think the learning here is once you start to do right to work checks, actually you have to you have to check your whole workforce, everybody. Do yeah. not just assume certain people don't need checking, and you can't you can't discriminate on the basis of their right to work. Um, and the length of it. This, I don't say this came as a surprise to me because nothing ever comes as a surprise, a surprise to me, but it may come as a surprise to others. We've got somebody who we're pretty certain is now an illegal worker. They don't have a right to work in the UK. Cathy, surely we can just tell them to go home. <laughs> if life was only that simple. Uh, no. Um, they are still currently an employee of yours, regardless of whether they're illegal or not. Um, and therefore, you must follow uh, what we call the three step process, which is, as we've identified on this slide, invite to attend to a meeting to raise serious rights, you know, in terms of the right to work concerns. It might be that at that meeting, they'll suddenly produce paperwork that gives you that reassurance. Um, but if they can't, um, you can then dismiss. However, don't forget that they still have a right of appeal because meantime, they might suddenly produce at appeal new evidence, which leads you to believe that they are not, they are legal. Um, if you do dismiss them, um, the fair reason for dismissal that you use in these circumstances is statutory illegality. Um, and finally, I would say there is plenty of unfair dismissal case law that has proven that an illegal worker can still win an unfair dismissal case if the employer failed to follow due process. Okay and again this is kind of almost counterintuitive but I know you've known about this for a long time but you just even if you get a call from the home office saying so and so is working for you they're illegal they need to stop working immediately you can't just go right okay that's instant dismissal. Yep. Well, you do step one that day. Step two is the meeting the following day. So you yes. don't hang about. <laughs> no, no, exactly. exactly. <laughs> but you do do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay. We've had some questions about volunteers. Cathy, you and I have gone through this, and I don't say we were surprised by it, but we were surprised by some of the government wording, I think. Yes, I mean, uh, as um, the quote down below so very kindly said, the legal distinction is not always clear. But who knew there was a difference between voluntary work and volunteering? And the key thing is, if it is voluntary work, then you must do right to work checks because they are classed as a worker. So what, what amounts to voluntary work? Well, I would suggest... It's, it's a more formal, ongoing arrangement. So, for instance, the classic example is um, a charity shop worker who turns up fairly regularly to help out in the charity shop. It could be a trustee um, of, a, of a small charity. But the idea being is that there is some element, not much, but there is some element of mutuality of obligation. They're not going to be paid for it, but the idea is that, that that volunteer provides work on services. And don't forget, benefits in kind could be anything from providing a free meal whilst you're having the trustees meeting um, through to maybe a bit of discount um, at the charity shop. 
those are benefits in kind. So it's another indication that that is voluntary work and therefore you must do a right to work check. We think that volunteering is a far looser and much more ad hoc arrangement. So, for instance, um, you decide to arrange a one off uh, fundraising event in the village and quite a few locals turn up to help you set up tables, chairs, etc, etc. That's volunteering in its purest form. No right to work check required. OK. We also raised the interesting spectre, didn't we, especially with some, some charities and things like that, where they have voluntary, if you like, trustees um, turning up and doing regular things. Maybe some, you know, all sorts of trades organisations and things have people voluntarily doing doing things and perhaps, you know, they get paid for by, by having a, a good, good lunch while they're doing the or they might have an honorarium, so they're paid an yeah, honorarium. Indeed. There are a number of, you know, somebody's asked a question about school governors. Um, this, this, is a, this is a right old minefield, but it very, very specifically mentioned in here, and the more formal the arrangements, I think I used the analogy earlier on, if it looks like something that if you weren't doing it voluntarily, you'd have to employ somebody to do, then it's probably voluntary work. But if it's just turning up and doing the odd collection um, in the church on a Sunday, it probably isn't. But if you agree to do it every week for the next year at 11 o'clock and leave at one o'clock, having counted up the collection and get a sandwich and a drink in return, it's probably voluntary work. Yeah. Sadly, yeah. I think... Yeah, school governors are a good example. On the other hand, if it's some a parent who comes along and helps with the annual sports day, they're just a volunteer. Yes, um, exactly. It, and the one thing, is. the one thing we've always said, because we do have quite a few clients who are charities or non-profit making organisations, mm -hmm. and we've always recommended um, that if you're going to have what I would call regular volunteers, uh, in other words, it's going to be voluntary work and therefore actually now uh, return to work, the right to work checks need to be done, um, then it's a good idea to actually put in writing exactly what the relationship is as a volunteer, because you can then link it to codes of conduct and, and, and the like. Yeah, okay. Finally, one of the legal pitfalls, because we know a lot of people employ quite a lot of students, Cathy, again, I'll ask you to, to do this because students have very often a limited right to work when they've got a visa to come over here. OK, so if they're on a course that lasts six months, they will not under any circumstances be permitted to work. And do remember when we talk about work, work is either paid or unpaid. Um, however, if they have come in they will have very clearly stated in their passport or the biometric residence permit, not only that they have a permit to work, but how long they are permitted to work during term time. Typically, it's either 10 or 20 hours. Um, now, the exception is that they can work full time before their course starts, during the holidays, or just after the course has been completed. The general idea is that the government doesn't want these students to fill permanent full-time vacancies. Mm. So the requirement on the employer is you need to take the information from the passport or, or the biometric and record exactly what the limit of the hours is, is uh, that they can do and make sure that they stick to that. You even have to record the dates of the term times during their course. So that, so if they're here on a three year um, course, then those dates may change every year. So you've got to be on top of it, find out what the dates are, because if you don't know what the dates are, you can't then know whether they can work for more hours or not. But, and this is where we really do think it's gonna fall down, which is if you don't communicate all of this information to their managers, guess what's going to happen? The manager's going to ask them, oh, we're a bit short staff. Can you come in and do extra work? And the student's thinking, hey, money. Yeah, they're not going to turn it down, even if possibly they know that probably they shouldn't be doing it. So 
then they does require a fair amount of communication and indeed training your managers um, in right to work checks, as well as it being potentially um, either payroll or an HR function. Uh, this is something that a lot of managers need to be aware of as well. Thank you. Um, listen, thank thank you both um, so far. I'm just going to just conclude. And one of the most important points to make, I see some of the questions coming in. We're not immigration specialists, so we can't tell you about immigration law, but we can tell you about how to check whether people have got the right to ch to work because that is part of employment law. And right to work checks, I think broadly speaking, the message is you can't avoid right to work checks. They need to be done. And if you do them, you need to do them across your whole workforce. It prompts a very interesting question, which we may get answered a question about later, is if you've got people who are very clearly doing voluntary work, but are all very clearly British because they've been doing it for years, and you've got a workforce, who may come from all over the world and you just check your workforce, you may be guilty of discrimination by admitting to do right to work checks on your voluntary workforce as well. So, so you just need to be careful about this. Consider it very carefully and take advice if you are in any doubt. Now, we have got loads of questions here and I've been going through and making some of them public and um, as we start to answer some of the questions, then perhaps we, we, we can release some more as well. But um, thank you very much indeed, everybody. That's the end of the formal part of the presentation. We're now going to ask answer questions. We have been asked one question, will you get a, post, a copy of the presentation from today? You'll actually get even better than that, you'll get a recording of the presentation today. But if anybody wants a specific copy of the presentation, we can send that out as well. We will be Recording our answers to the Q&As uh, from here, and we always send out a sheet of those as quickly as we can do, together with some other documentation that should be helpful to you. Thanks for listening this week. And remember, the law is changing very rapidly at the moment, so view this as guidelines and not qualified legal advice. Our advice always to everybody at the end of these sessions is that the normal laws of employment still apply. Stay informed, keep up to date with the law. If you are uncertain about what you are doing, take professional advice. We can certainly help if you've got a query of any sort and we're in regular contact with clients who are trying to solve very similar problems to you. Communicate regularly with your staff. Be firm but sympathetic. Do not discriminate, protect the vulnerable and be prepared. Good luck and thank you for listening.